Hi Deepali and welcome to our community named MIM Wizard. This is a study abroad student community that we are building and we are so glad to have you as the first guest on our podcast show. How are you doing there? I'm good. I'm great. How are you, Sohan? Yeah, it's like 10 p.m. <laughs> here in India and uh, we are studying for our college exam. So it's been a long day already. And uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it from my side. <laughs> and uh, can you can you please introduce yourself to the audience of the podcast show? Sure. Um, so I'm doing my, I'm currently pursuing my master's in engineering and management from MIT School of Engineering and the Sloan School of Management. Uh-huh. <laughs> I come from Delhi, India. That's where I did most of my, all of my schooling, in fact. I uh, uh-huh. went to Triple IT Delhi for my undergrad in computer science and engineering, and then worked at Dell for six years, um, two years as a software engineer, and four years as a product manager in the e commerce space. And now I'm here at MIT in MS uh, in engineering and management. Uh-huh. That's that's really interesting. Now we can begin the podcast like by going back to the point when you were studying at Triple IT Delhi, like the computer science and engineering course. So, like, what were the projects that you were working on? What were what was your mindset as a student at Triple IT Delhi? If you could talk about your undergrad experience overall. Sure. Um, so Triple IT Delhi was a very interesting uh, place for me, simply because uh-huh. I don't know if you guys know it was incepted in two thousand nine. Uh-huh. And it was a very nascent college when I joined it. So there was a lot of scope. There was a lot of scope to become a great club leader, to become a uh-huh. student representative, to take the college forward to a place where it is competitive and, you know, is appearing in all these great university competitions. So there was a lot that could have been done with Triple ID. And I was very glad that I was at a point where I could contribute to that movement. Uh-huh. So in Triple ID, I was very active part of the student body. I was student representative twice, worked with a lot of clubs, organized a lot of debating events. And academically, um, Triple ID identifies itself as a research-led institute. So there is research happening in every hook and corner of the college. Every course that you take, uh, you know, the academics are the core focus and the faculty comes from uh, really great places and are really at the top of their field in India and abroad. Um, in terms of projects, uh, there is there was scope to take up a thesis and uh-huh. independent projects. Um, I took a thesis in collaboration with Dell, which was EMC at that point of time. And that was basically my internship. Um, that was also where I got the first and the only patent that I have so far in my life. Uh-huh. Um, so we worked on a query, uh, the natural language based query engine, uh, which got uh-huh. patented in the US office later. So there's a lot of scope for collaboration with industries that way. And then my other projects were in machine learning and program analysis. So in machine learning, I was trying to make this uh, device during which you can detect whether the person who is driving is driving rashly or not. Uh-huh. Um, so if you can tell that, it could be of use to companies like Uber and Lyft, where yeah. you can tell whether uh-huh. their drivers are driving rashly or not. I could have totally taken it forward, but I did not. I went back uh-huh. to work in the industry. Uh-huh. And the other project was in program analysis, where I was trying to identify how much energy a chip uses. Uh-huh. Um, so the use of that is that once you know how much energy a chip uses, especially in the embedded software systems, you uh-huh. can pretty uh, charge the batteries. Uh-huh. In fact, uh, if we were able to do that with accuracy, uh, the North Star is that you can come up with devices that have really long lasting uh, batteries. But that project was a dead end. And I learned in the hard way that sometimes in research, there are no answers and you uh-huh. have to move on. Uh, apart from that, there were tons of these group projects, like in mobile computing, I was building this um, uh-huh. lock screen device where you can see the weather. You already have those apps, but at that time in 2014, 2013, yeah, yeah. it was the latest thing. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there was these, I, I took this course on image analysis where we were building uh-huh. these hand gesture recognition devices. And so yeah. Triple uh-huh. is a great place, like every course has its own um, project and yeah. yeah, I think yeah, the ones that I mentioned are the ones that I individually took initiative to be a part of. Uh-huh. 
that that actually sounds very interesting so like i can like from this answer that you gave i can infer that you did explore multiple domains like you like you mentioned about software development as well you mentioned about computer science embedded systems embedded software i don't know i don't know if these are the same things but then like what are the domains that you explored while being at triple it that's a great question because when i look back at my college experience that's one thing that i keenly noticed that there were a lot of my friends who were focused on only ai or only ml or mm-hmm. they wanted to build their profile in one domain and i think that's great because mm-hmm. the more specific you are the more potential you have to excel in that field i was somebody who was <laughs> never really sure of what i wanted mm-hmm. you know what i'm great at so i literally just cast a very f- wide net Um Triple mm-hmm. IT is also different in a sense that uh when you look at other engineering colleges and the first year is all 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 the same for all the branches right Yeah yeah I don't know if it's the same thing these yeah, days yeah. but in my time yeah mm-hmm. So Triple IT is slightly different my first class day 1 was Python mm-hmm. Okay and I had no coding experience whatsoever and the uh-huh. first year was operating systems and all the core computer science courses that people typically do in their second or third year of engineering Uh-huh. So while triple IDians already do these courses in the first two years, the advantage uh-huh. is that they have the whole third and fourth year to do whatever they want. Uh-huh. And when I got this opportunity, I was like, okay, let's try everything. So I did security, then I did program analysis, secure coding, uh-huh. uh, mobile computing, uh, machine learning. So I cast a very wide net. Um, but yeah, I've I've changed my strategy at MIT. Uh, uh-huh. quite a bit like now i'm very focused at and uh-huh. and i think that's i think i wouldn't say either of them is bad it depends on your personality if you're uh-huh. a person who likes to focus on one thing in great detail and you've already found your passion uh-huh. because there were people in my class who were doing coding since class 6 or 7 uh-huh. so you can't expect like they know what they want to do like i've yeah. just had friends who knew from the very start that they want to be in machine learning uh-huh. so for them it makes perfect sense to be focused but then there are people like me who have no idea whatsoever and yeah. experimentation is the best way to find out mhm and then as a student at triple it mm-hmm. like what was your mindset like because like when you're exploring so many domains you need to be active like in like building projects as well and doing xyz like multiple things so what was your mindset as a student at triple it i would say i was a very enthusiastic student i wasn't somebody who was like um i have to get a 10 in this Interestingly uh-huh. all my life I've been very focused on like getting grades and marks but specifically uh-huh. in triple ID and I did still get, got a great grade it's, it's like I still got a great GPA but that wasn't my core focus uh-huh. uh, my core focus was on learning um and on building this you know enjoying my just just my life and people uh-huh. around and um I don't think I was I went in with any set thing that this is what I want to focus on and uh-huh. I I'm, I'm sure things would have changed by now but I really just went with the flow. Uh-huh. Um I think you asked a specific question right? Uh what yeah I would say I was just enthusiastic and I said yes to a uh-huh. lot of things. I was just very really proactive uh, like organizing cultural fest or technical fest. And uh-huh. these things are important because uh-huh. when I look back I think um they helped build my personality in a much better way uh-huh. i became much conf- much more confident as a person uh-huh. um so yeah i definitely encourage engaging with the college community in whichever way you can it's not just about giving back but it's about building your own personality to a level that you know you're <coughs> great at communication and talking to people and confident enough because this is this is something yeah. that really plays a big role in your work life Mhm. And then like you know after utilizing your four years completely like I'm pretty sure you must have had a thought of like pursuing a higher education did you did you think about like getting into research or getting into one particular domain while you were in college like how did the thought of uh, like getting into MIT or like pursuing a particular course happen and when did it happen Um honestly I in college I was not focused on uh, uh-huh. higher studies at all which is uh-huh. very unlike also of triple idians because almost 70% 60% of students uh-huh. around me were focused on higher education most of them went right into phd's after triple id uh-huh. uh, i was in one of them i was just like i worked for a few years and figured it out uh-huh. uh, but one thing i always had in my mind uh, which was even before i went to triple id was that if i ever go abroad for higher education it has to be in top 5 or top 10 otherwise okay I mean, uh-huh. it's just me, and I don't encourage that. Uh, discourage it. I mean, it's up to you. A lot of people just go 
abroad because they want to experience abroad mm-hmm. but for me it was always about going and making it to one of the top colleges if, if i ever go mm-hmm. and i wasn't too keen on it at least in triple id uh-huh but i was never building that profile that talking to professors because i thought that oh i'll need an lor or anything because i just mm-hmm. wasn't sure that i'll go for higher education got it got it and then right out of triple it you you like worked in 6 years at dell so like talking about that complete experience so what were your learning experiences or your corporate experience of working at dell so what was the culture or like how did you uh, like you know pursue multiple projects and things at dell like initially you mentioned you were a software developer and then later on and like during throughout the course of 6 years you then became a product manager as well so what was that entire journey like Yeah, at Dell it was very interesting uh, because I think I spent six years there, and strangely, uh-huh. every year almost I worked in a different team or in a different project, uh-huh. which is not a lot of people can say about their work life. Mm-hmm. I was very lucky that way. Uh-huh. I actually joined Dell. Oh, sorry, I actually joined EMC Corporation. Um, mm-hmm. EMC Corporation was this big company in uh, managing data servers mm-hmm. and storage arrays. So basically, uh, if you look at big hospitals in the U.S. or even Aadhaar systems or any big government, you know, data, we always mm-hmm. look at the surface layer, which is Google and Amazon Web Services and whatever. Yeah. But EMC was building these storage arrays where data was actually getting stored. The hardware. Mm-hmm. So I joined EMC as a software engineer. Mm-hmm. The first year I worked on the storage array solution called Inflex. I was coding for the firmware. Uh, but i could also see that the industry was going towards cloud and this was again like 2016 2017 okay. with cloud and everything the yeah, especially dockers and um virtualization was picking up big time mm-hmm. um in 2016 also emc and dell had a big merger um so there was this opportunity to basically transition into the steam which was helping in digital transformation and dell had come up with this unique um type of system with type of or like team where even if you were a software engineer one mm-hmm. you were not just an engineer but you were training people to become okay. uh, uh to become adept in extreme programming and mm-hmm. agile and devops and that was super competitive uh, but i interviewed for that position and i got in and that was a life changing decision at dell for me Mm-hmm. because that was also the place where i got my product management gig um so i was working with e-commerce as a consultant within the mm-hmm. server so software engineer and i was helping e-commerce teams transition into digital transformation and transition into devops model and extreme pro- programming model and i was working with them and there was an opening for a product manager i spoke to the director of software mm-hmm. engineering and he interviewed me he liked my profile so then i transitioned into product management and that uh-huh. was also great that way like there that you can once you have your you know you have those um you have proven yourself as whatever you got in like marketing manager or whatever there's a lot of flexibility to move around and that is a really great place for that because they encourage it they uh-huh. encourage you to go to multiple places and explore the company culture is great uh, uh-huh. i still am surprised by how wonderful the culture is like throughout the uh-huh. way I had one of some of the best times uh, with the company. It was so understanding. Everybody was really understanding. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that Dell is a great company from a work culture standpoint. Uh, everybody around is very uh, empathetic, and um, I've never had those typical experiences uh, that people talk about in MNCs. My managers have been so great that I'm still in touch with almost <laughs> all of them, uh, which That's not cool, a lot yeah. of people can say. Um, uh huh. Yeah, they were so invested. Even when I was applying to MIT, I was very transparent with them. They gave me the mm-hmm. awards. They knew. Um, so it's a great company that way. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I moved around quite a bit, hustled a lot, uh, moved from that uh, firmware to cloud, then worked in cloud for a year, then product management, e-commerce. Within e-commerce, also, I started with product services. Then I moved uh-huh. to um, monitoring. Then I moved to search. and i think the last two years of dell i spent in search mm-hmm. that's that's a really wonderful journey so if you want if you could condense the entire journey in terms of the learnings that you've had throughout these multiple years working in multiple domains and with teams like you know who are, which are working in the product side as well which are working in the development side as well so what will those learnings be 
I think number one is uh, relationships are far more important than you think, especially uh-huh. uh, the relationships that you build with your coworkers and your managers. Uh-huh. Uh, that goes a really long way. You never know when you when something might open up and you might want to go back or you know grow your career. Uh-huh. Um, so at least for me, when I came out of triple IT, I I didn't know that. I didn't know that this was like the number one thing, but I slowly realized that that is. Uh-huh. Um, the second thing is that know what you bring to the table. Um, uh-huh. That's very important. Um, for me, that was not so hard because I was already a computer science grad and I was a technical product manager. Uh-huh. You do not have a lot of technical product managers who have computer science background. Uh-huh. Um, so for me, it was actually, I knew that I was somebody who understood what the engineers are co- going through. And I was an engineer myself at some point. Um, so I had uh-huh. that sense of empathy while managing teams. Um, so know what you bring. Um, mm-hmm. And the third thing is don't be afraid to ask because most of these transitions that I did, be mm-hmm. it from, um, you know, firmware to cloud or cloud to product management or within product management, mm-hmm. uh, nobody was going to come to you. Um, you have to go to them and say that this is what you want. Uh, so don't be afraid of saying that. The worst answer would be no. No, yeah. Um, but you would be surprised that if the answer is yes, it can actually be really good for your career. Exactly. Like, you know, this is what I've been experiencing as well when I'm like, you know, approaching people for shooting the podcast. The worst thing that can happen is no. And the best thing that can happen is you end up shooting a podcast with the MIT students. So that's like, <laughs> that's a real implementation right there. And um, yeah, and then talking about like, um, like, you know, we, we could zoom in about product management in detail, probably like because you mentioned about the term like technical product management, like I agree uh, to the fact that tech, like product management is still a pretty fresh career in the market. Like we've done a couple of podcasts about product management as well. The people keep saying the same thing, like it's a pretty fresh career. So then what's your take about product management or if you could share your experience and insights of like working just in into the product management domain because like it's an intersection between tech and business uh, knowledge is what I believe. So like if you could expand on that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's fresh. <laughs> I think it's saturated <laughs> to be honest. Uh, there's just so many PMs around. Uh, but uh-huh. I, I think, uh, yeah, every, every company has a very different definition of it. Uh-huh. Um, there is a stark difference in how product management is in a big company versus how it is in a small startup. Uh-huh. Um, in a startup, you're expected to wear way more hats than uh, you might be expected to wear in a yeah. big company or vice versa. Uh-huh. Um, the role typically involves, uh, you want to know what the role involves, right? Um, uh-huh. What it's like to be a PM. Um, there are multiple, uh, and I think I could suggest a couple of books. I think Lean Principles of Eric Ries is a great place to start. Uh-huh. Um, it's mostly about understanding the problem. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a lot about solving the problem, but first part is to understand the problem mm-hmm. from a customer standpoint and to know, um, wh- whether it makes sense or not like that analysis part of it. Uh, there'll be tons of things that customers would ask you to do. Um, as a product management manager, you bring your expertise in saying, what are the advantages and disadvantages from an engineering business and customer standpoint? So you're basically uh-huh. at the intersection of engineering customers and uh, the business, and uh-huh. you're the one deci- deciding uh, whether it makes sense or not. So the priority and the feasibility uh, of, of of the feature that's, that 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 yeah. you know, customer has suggested or you have come up with, and then how much time it takes, and you know managing the entire life cycle of a product. Uh, So basically the way I look at it, at least um, in the context of how I work, the why, the what, and the how. The how is always the engineering. The engineering Mm -hmm. decides how something has to be implemented. The why usually comes from um, the design, like design of customer interviews and, you know, the the intention of why this feature should be there. It could be for the market. It could be for business. And the what is, is sort of product management, like it decides what needs to be done, uh, mm-hmm. considering the why and the how. Um, so basically, it's an, like, you know, that's how it works. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's how I think it, think of it in my head, that uh, why, why is coming from business, what is product management and how is engineering. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I can't go into a lot of details, but there is this whole 
think about MVPs and customer centric view and customer interviews and uh-huh. uh, prioritization, road mapping, scoping, uh, defining the backlog. It's a lot to be covered in uh-huh. one interview question, uh, but that's the gist of it. Basically, you manage yeah. the product. Yeah, that was a great framework. Um, and then talking about uh, like your decision of pursuing a higher education while you were like, you know, working at Dell. So when did the thought of like pursuing a master's in management come in and how did you like start navigating after you like decided to like, you know, this is what I have to do. I need to get an education now. So what, how, how did that process begin? Uh, I think 2019 was when, um, I was very keen on pursuing higher education. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, 2020, we had COVID. Yeah. Um, so because of COVID, my plans got shifted two years. Uh-huh. Um, I wouldn't say I was very targeted on MIM. Um, I just wanted to pursue something in management, uh, be it an MBA or an another degree. Um, so I was very open to multiple options that were out there. Uh-huh. And the MITs, um, so this program that I'm part of is actually called SDM, which is System Design and Management Program. Uh-huh. But the degree that you get is Master's in Engineering and Management. Um, so it's specifically called out to me because um, unlike a lot of people, I had this clarity that I want to be in tech. Uh-huh. Um, so because I had this clarity, I was I, I thought this degree made perfect sense because now I can not just only take courses from Sloan, but I can also expand my knowledge base and get more technically adept by taking courses in computer science and other schools of engineering at MIT. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say I was very targeted, um, mm-hmm. I was just very open, uh, flexible in terms of the degree that I wanted to pursue. Mm-hmm. And then like, because you had the clarity, is that the reason why your motive was also very clear that you want to stay into tech and then at the same time, like, you know, get into management. So was, was that also like the motive, uh, behind that? Because a lot of people hear what happens is they decide to pursue higher education after getting a work experience of, let's say two years or three years. But once they get into the industry, they start working and earning, they find it very, very difficult to like get out and then pursue an education. So like, what was your motivation? Oh, yeah. So um, I actually like tech. I like uh-huh. being a product manager. I loved my job. It wasn't like I was trying to get out of anything. But I also knew that, I and, I, and this is, again, my uh, perspective, and a lot of people may agree or disagree. Uh-huh. I feel like education is not something for the short term. It's not yeah. like one day you decide that you do an MBA and your life will change forever. Um, uh-huh. It doesn't work. At least in my opinion, doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But maybe a few years down the line, um, the connections you made or, you know, the kind of profile you built might actually help you um, become better, become a better leader or become a better manager. Um, Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking for any any way out. But when I was working, I realized that I just had technical expertise and no expertise on finance or strategy or operations or uh, marketing, any of that. And a lot of that is needed as you grow up your grow up a lot. Like there's a reason why MBAs are known as people who leave mm-hmm. organizations because they have that skill set, those hard mm-hmm. skills that yeah. you do not learn. Now, whether you compensate for those skill sets by reading books on your own, which is perfectly acceptable. I've seen executives who have grown from engineering into, you know, SVPs and VPs and Bs at big corporations, but they have spent the time. I've personally spoken to them and they have told me they have spent the time learning these um, skills from various sources, be it people, be it um, Mm -hmm. books. So, I mean, whether you fill those gaps through degrees or courses, that's totally up to you. Um, So for me, I think I, I was keen on you know, I wanted to, I was keen on taking that jump and doing a proper degree to get those skill gaps and skill sets filled. Got it. Got so it was it. more about filling gaps and skill sets rather than trying to change my career. 
that's a very fresh perspective on like pursuing a higher education because a lot of people either want to get into some specialization or some people just want to make as make it as a career switch as you mentioned but then this is a very like you complement you you introduce yourself to some complementary skills by getting a degree so that's that's really inspiring actually and then the immediate question that i have is like while you were making this decision of like getting an education into management field so then the naturally the the question that comes in is like mba or mim so how did you compare both of these options i'm pretty sure a lot of people must be asking you this question as well so like if you could tell us about like mba versus mim like what's your perspective about it yeah sure so i one thing i want to call out is that mit is the only university in the world that requires 5 years of work ex for an mim it's not even an mim it's engineering and management so it's not like yeah uh, so you actually take courses from both uh the other thing unique about mit is that if you look at other universities uh, mim programs they're all driven by school of engineering and you don't necessarily get to take classes at the business school so mm-hmm. for example if you look at stanford stanford's masters in master of science in management and engineering um is driven by stanford school of engineering and you do not get to take classes at graduate school of business Mm-hmm. but at mit you get to take classes at sloan uh, and you also um, have so you will be surprised uh, the average work ex of my cohort is 9.5 <laughs> years i'm <laughs> actually on the younger side uh-huh. uh, which is very surprising and that's not a typical mim cohort mim mm-hmm. typically is for students who are right out of undergrad yeah um so the mit's uh, M- and we call it mem like mem was unique in a sense that um it allowed me to go after 6 years and be with people who are like minded and who who are actually way more senior to me i i i have ceos in my class i have a oh. lot of people from very diverse backgrounds in my class and i'm very happy to share that the uh-huh. peer learning happening so it's not like any other uh, program that i came across uh-huh. and then i did apply to b schools i actually um, got into uh, m7 b schools too okay <laughs> but because of my own and the reasons that uh, i wanted to experience mit school of engineering and um this degree was so flexible in terms of the amount of time i want to complete it and all the num- it was it's basically based off of credits mm-hmm. so it's a very flexible degree um so because of those reasons i was very happy like you know was going to say no to mit when you've been an engineer <laughs> um for those reasons i chose mit but i did apply to these schools too and i actually made to m7s too got it that that's really interesting and then like the immediate follow up question that i have for this is like you mentioned you have applied to multiple b schools as well so like you know it's like it it would take us a lot of time to talk about each b school and their interview experiences and all so if you could condense all your experiences in like one single answer of like giving like what are the top th- top things that you learned after like interviewing for them or like through the application process because a lot of students usually ask these questions as well like how is the interview experience at mit like interview experience at stanford like so i'm pretty sure Sure, every student must be having a different experience, but the tips more or less remain the same. So, what 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 would be your suggestions about it? Sure, sure. And I think before I answer that, I also want to call out that MIM is if you're sure you want to stay in engineering and you know in the field that you are, if you want to get into more of strategy consulting and general management, then maybe MBA is better for you. And mm-hmm. also, the amount of years you spend, like if you spend more years in the industry, then MBA is probably better, unless you find a degree like the one that I'm in, where the average work ex is more. Uh-huh. Um, coming back to the interviews, yes, in every program that uh, I eventually made made it made to, and even this MIT and M E M, which was an engineering management, we had an interview. Um, so specifically for the interview, uh, I literally followed. the cliched advice just be yourself uh, and i'm generally this way um, mm-hmm. one of the core values that i live by is authenticity uh, mm-hmm. and i think somewhere it also comes it shows because uh, i i did prep uh, i pre- i did prep in terms of kind of like i remember um, some some universities have this thing where they bring up like a question on the screen and mm-hmm. then boom like a video and okay. they give you no time to set your hair or whatever and you just start talking okay. um mm-hmm. so i would say 
I, I have personally been great at talking publicly because I was good at debating in school. So I wasn't uh-huh. very nervous per se. Like I'm never nervous when I'm talking that way. Um, but if you're someone who does get nervous, one of the things you can do is start practicing right away because these are mm-hmm. not the skills that you can build up in a week or two. It's not like yeah. you, know, you have an interview and two days before you can start pre- preparing mm-hmm. yourself. Um, uh, the kind of questions they ask are very typical. Uh, the ones that you find on the internet or in the books. I think there's a big, like this thick book on MBA. I uh-huh. don't remember its name. It's green in color. <laughs> but that book literally has all, it's like a standard book that everybody has if they want to go to mm-hmm. MBA. Um, mm-hmm. So the questions are very similar. Talk about yourself. Uh, one of the challenges that you face at work, um, your leadership values, um, very standard questions. You can prep the answers, but one of the things that I did was just be very like natural and not mm-hmm. be too prepped up that it comes across as artificial. Yeah. Um, and then there were, there were these instances because I was also talking to my friends who were applying with me mm-hmm. and I could also talk from their experience. There was this one particular, and I wouldn't say the name of the school, that there was this one particular school where um, there was one person who was notorious for, being very nonchalant while interviewing you and being like, oh, I'm like, uh-huh. not interested in whatever. Uh, so I knew that already. And mm-hmm. those are the interesting ones because you have to know that there's a reason why an interviewer is acting like that because they want mm-hmm. to see your how you react to those uh, yeah. emotional situations. Um, mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. There's a reason why somebody acts with you the way they do. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, like sometimes it will be hard to build those relationships, but just be focused on being yourself and being, you know, that emotionally stable person, no matter what the reaction of the interview is and mm-hmm. not keeping, not taking it personally because you have to know this is, there's a reason why they're doing this. Uh-huh. This, this yeah. happens. This really happens. They, they, they test you, they stress test you. Mm-hmm. One school believe- does that. Uh-huh. So does this, does this also happen during like your job interviews as well, or is it only the case for like the university interviews? So I haven't interviewed a lot for jobs because I've stayed in one place for such a long time, but, um, uh-huh. I don't think so. Like, I don't think I've seen stress interviews and jobs as such. Mm-hmm. Maybe I haven't Got applied it. for those jobs, but, <laughs> but mostly like in B schools, I, I face them, um, in two schools. Uh-huh. Got it. And then if we could give some tips about like building applications, your, your uh, sorry, building your profile and then studying for GMAT or GRA, because these are the questions that people must be asking you. I'm pretty sure like, how do you build an application so that you get into MIT or like, how do you score the perfect GRE or GMAT score or like, or like what, what's, what's your suggestion or tips about those things? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any perfect, um, GMAT GR, GRE score, but one thing that I realized was my mistake and I realized it pretty late was that try to get these exams right out of your way as soon mm-hmm. as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when you're in uh, your undergrad, you're still studying, you're still in that mode where uh, you can quickly answer the kind of questions they ask. But as you get older, you lose practice and mm-hmm. you're not as great at them as you would think you might be. So when I was applying and appearing for GMAT at 26, 27 years of age, I was a little like, oh, I could have done this way better. And, you know, when I was 21, 23, I was so smart back then. There's mm-hmm. some truth to that. I'm not saying it's impossible. I, I'm mm-hmm. not saying I couldn't crack it and I didn't do it, but I think I had to work a lot harder to make that happen. Mm-hmm. So number one tip, doesn't matter if you don't eventually end up applying and going to a school like that um, please um, you know get these exams and tests exams, out of yeah. your way as soon as you can the second thing is um, and this was somebody something that somebody told me and I think it's very true try to get rejections okay so when you apply um, make sure that you get a few rejections because if you don't then you'll feel like you didn't try hard enough Okay. Like imagine you applied to five schools and you got uh-huh. accepted by all five. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it feel like, oh, I wish I had applied to a Stanford or an MIT yeah. or a Harvard. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then maybe I would have made it because it's such a black box process that you never really know. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you might think you might underestimate your profile consultants might underestimate your profile but you never know what actually about your profile might shine out to these schools um so sky is the limit and mm -hmm. um, do apply to a few places where you actually expect to get rejected so that you you, you feel satisfied in your head uh -huh. yeah so number one was apply uh, get the test out of the way yeah and then target Face schools meditation. that you think you may not yeah yeah mm -hmm. and um and then i think just carve your story um uh -huh. I, i also know like in mit i specifically remember um i was very to the point in my sap like i did not of course there was a word limit but i was very uh -huh. to the point and i really wrote um, authentically who i was like i literally mm -hmm. did not beat about the bush um, which is very unlike of a lot of applications Mm -hmm. uh, so don't be afraid take your chances mm -hmm. in these applications mm -hmm. and bring your true authentic self out because that's what's valued mm -hmm. got it um, and uh, is is there anything more that you would like to add over here um i mean there are a lot of things that are specific to me and may not apply mm -hmm. to a lot of people Mm -hmm. um the other thing is be open to experiences mm -hmm. a lot of my friends were just so stringent mm -hmm. on schools that they wanted to get in or mm -hmm. the kind of degree that they wanted to pursue but i was always very flexible i wasn't like very headstrong that if mm -hmm. no hps then no nothing um mm -hmm. sometimes being flexible is good um, mm -hmm. and then finances i think that's yeah. one of the most important thing mm -hmm. um everybody's life is different stories different journeys different finances are way different yeah um, so just keep that in mind uh, mm -hmm. not everybody is you know rich enough to like um, so if, <laughs> yeah. if you're somebody who knows that you cannot afford it and will end up in a big debt mm -hmm. then you definitely need to score way higher marks in gmat for a scholarship mm -hmm. uh, than your peer whose family is better off and can afford to pay that fees Mm -hmm. and then the second thing is that um if you're an indian male mm -hmm. apply in for round 1 that's what i've heard that you stop yeah. getting interview calls for round 2s um mm -hmm. if you're like a commonly represented at cohort uh, i did not go for um consulting help mm -hmm. and i did not recommend it personally mm -hmm. uh, for reasons of my own uh -huh. uh, but if you want to go for that just make sure that the person gets you and mm -hmm. represents your stories and does not warp it in a way that is not that is unlike you. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say is try to understand the school too. Uh, every mm -hmm. school is unique. Every school needs different is looking for a different thing and they mm -hmm. have their own rubric which is very different. So it's not mm -hmm. like all IVs have similar rubric. Mm -hmm. Um so keep that in mind even if you think you're a star person, star student and you have great mm -hmm. chances. um just be unique for every application that you apply to got it got it that that was a really insightful answer and then uh, like you know i just missed a question probably though like i've noted it down like uh, you attended this google retreat scholarship thing in china way back in 2015 so that's not something that a lot of people know about so could you tell us more about like what's it exactly about and then like how did you get in and what's the entire thing about Sure. Uh, so the Google Scholarship is now rebranded as Women Technical Scholarship, mm -hmm. um, and they have changed the program significantly. Like the year I got it, they only had like eight people across India mm -hmm. chosen, uh, but okay. now they have like fifty people uh, getting uh -huh. chosen every year. Um, mm -hmm. And you can now search it as Google Women Technical Scholarship. So okay. this program is basically to further the vision of. uh Anita Borg Dr Anita Borg who is a computer scientist mm -hmm. and it's similar to like the Grace Hopper initiative but in this um what Google does is this is a like a global scholarship and it's divided into a lot of continents like you have the Asia Pacific version and then you have mm -hmm. the North America's version and the Europe version South America mm -hmm. is like that so mm -hmm. I wanted for the Asia Pacific region and there were around 40 30 of us 30 to 40 of us i think 30 across asia and from countries like australia even mm -hmm. pakistan bangladesh china um all of these you know asian countries mm -hmm. and they were all women who were uh, doing something in computer science and the criteria mm -hmm. was 
I had to submit three essays. I think there was a short interview um, and then my CGPA, my resume, and then leadership um, mm-hmm. qualities. And that's where what I mentioned about taking a lot of lead in my undergrad in student community comes in. I think that helped me um, show those qualities uh, uh-huh. for the scholarship. Um, and as part of the scholarship, you get one lakh INR rupees from Google. At least that's how much I got in 2015. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And a fully sponsored trip to Shanghai. Um, that place keeps Correct. changing. So uh-huh. I got it to Shanghai. Um, women before me got it to Sydney. Um, uh-huh. Then then the year after was actually Taj Faluknama Palace, which okay. is in India. So they keep changing uh-huh. the place based on uh-huh. the budget of Google and where they want to go and all of that. Uh-huh. But most importantly, there are two things that the scholarship gives you. One is exposure, and the uh-huh. second is uh, network. Um, okay. So I became friends with some of most amazing people I can talk about who are now doing like great research and PhDs and uh-huh. in some of the top places: Stanford, even Harvard, MIT. They're, they're already uh-huh. there doing postdocs. They're like an amazing cohort of people who are very passionate about computer science and. Uh, who are doing great things. And mm-hmm. you also get to meet, like, build this network with Googlers. Needless That's... to say, you get to interview with Google when you want and when you feel ready. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's all of those, like, Google is known for, like, you know, pampering you. So they took us <laughs> on a cruise night and there were a lot of That's, these amazing yeah, things. So um, amazing. Made yeah. us stay mm-hmm. great places. Uh-huh. Um I think that was one of the best trips of my life, like luxury wise. It was one of the most luxurious <laughs> trips I've ever taken in uh-huh. my life. Uh, That's... And then after, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, after that trip, I also got a lot of like some money from Google to further that vision. So you have to basically, it's not like, that, okay, I can just <laughs> take that money, you have to do something with it. Uh-huh. And not with those one lakh, the one lakh is yours. Um, it's mm-hmm. up to you. You can spend it in higher education or um, on something. I used it for my college fees. Uh-huh. Um, but then other than that, uh, you can also come up with some idea of your own. Like I uh-huh. was trying to build this chapter of upskilling women in communication skills and computer science and triple ID. So I use some of the budget to invite people from HPS over to give talks there. So you can, uh-huh. build, you know, Google, if you're doing something great, um, Google will give you that budget. And in future, they invite you to other WTM scholarships, and it's this whole community that you're part of. Mm-hmm. Like next year in 2016, um, Google sponsored my first trip to the US um, for the Grace Hopper Conference as part uh-huh. of the scholarship in Houston. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot that Google can do once you get mm-hmm. into this one. It's a great, great place to be. That's really amazing. I think I heard about it for the first time, and it's so beautiful. I mean, like, you know, it's it's just amazing. I'm spellbound. Literally. You wanna be a you wanna be a woman in tech now, <laughs> and I think it's a great yeah, yeah like, absolutely absolutely yeah. And uh, like talking to the like coming to the main part of the episode, which is about your experience at MIT. I think a lot of people want to know about like what's it studying like MIT, what are the courses at MIT, the curriculum at MIT, MIT the, uh, the like the student pool at MIT. So we will we'll talk about it one by one. So why don't you like please start from the research aspect of MIT? Like you've mentioned, like there's there's like a lot of scope over there, and it's the best university in the world. So what's what's it like to be there? Um, I think research-wise, it truly is <laughs> one of uh-huh. the best places to be. Um, MIT is a very ground-up organization. Um, uh-huh. so every department, every school of engineering has funding of its own. And there's a lot happening. It's so much that we have this common phrase at MIT, which is called the fire hose. So just like, you know, there's a lot of water gushing through a fire hose. You have so much happening every day that you if you don't know where you want to focus on, you're literally lost in that fire hose. Like it's as, I mean, it's literally like that. Um, and then it is truly, uh, I think, when I think of MIT, the top word that comes to my mind is passion. There's mm-hmm. just so much passion in every hook and corner of it, be it the undergrad students. Like I was part of um, one of, I was a DA for one of the undergrad classes and the kind of passion and the hard work that students do there. Everybody is super down to earth and they're just working and doing their own thing. I don't think I've ever seen this much of collective passion 
um, anywhere else in the world so far. Um, from a research perspective, it's a very open organization. Um, for example, the degree that I'm doing, as long as you have School of Engineering uh, associated with the department that you want to work mm-hmm. with or have course in, you're allowed to. So it's not mm-hmm. just computer science, but I can also take courses in civil, mechanical, electrical, or um, you know, even nuclear physics. Like it's it's, uh-huh. it's up to you what you want to do. Um, there are people with my cohort legend who have <laughs> this. So this this one person in my cohort, and he has an interesting background. He was a consultant in Bain McKinsey. Uh, I think he was in Bain, and then he had like twenty years of work ex behind him, and then he did this degree, and now he's doing a PhD in like and working with NASA. So like it's oh just, there's just so much that you can do. Um, you just have uh-huh. to know what you want to do. Mm-hmm. You can um, be a research assistant with any department um, if you you know if you have the right cadets and if you mm-hmm. um, showcase that you can do this. I think that's the most important thing. Your talent is uh, mm-hmm. valued way more um, than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, classes are super interesting. I think one of the things that I noticed, which was quite different from what we have been used to uh, teaching is that how everything is at least in school of engineering um, mm-hmm. it starts from a basic level uh, to a degree that everything is just so super clear so mm-hmm. um, like i think i think mit is really great at simplifying complex things Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's something super complex, the way they teach you is that you understand it very easily, and that was like super to me. I was like, wow, I could have never imagined that I could understand a neural network this way. Like they made us draw neural networks with hands, and I was like, there's no other place in the world that this is happening. Um, uh-huh. So they made us draw SVM machines with hand, and people who understand that would know that this is not typically how AI or ML start outside. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the way of teaching is definitely great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, what else is there? Yeah, uh, I mean, every day I'm in there, I'm like, how did I made it? Uh, <laughs> it's just a feeling that goes away. Uh-huh. Um, I think I'm, I'm very grateful uh, mm-hmm. to be there. Yeah, I mean, listening to all of this just puts a smile on my face. Like you literally covered every aspect of it, like the curriculum, like the students at MIT, the overall atmosphere, the research work at MIT. Is there anything more that you would want to add about your experience so far at MIT? Yeah, I would just say that if you are coming here, um, it's far more valuable if you know exactly what you want out of that experience, mm-hmm. because of the sheer fact that there's just so much happening around. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Got more it. focused you are, the better your probability of getting what you want. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, passion. Like this is a lot of entrepreneurship happening, a lot of startups. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like what are the projects or like the startups that people are building or working upon? Uh, a, lot of, a lot around sustainability and climate change these days. At least that's mm-hmm. what I'm noticing. A lot of startups uh-huh. are coming up for that. Um a lot of energy too, um, again, uh-huh. related to climate change, autonomous vehicles. Uh-huh. Um, and then you have, um, I think there's a lot of other things like uh, biomed and robotics. Uh-huh. Um, there's this, um, so MIT has this Delta V organization. There are a lot of them. There is uh, Martin, Des- uh, Martin Des Center of Entrepreneurship. There are a lot of them, but you could also take a look at that and see the kind of work that's happening. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, I think around me, I see a lot happening in medical field, uh-huh. sustainability, energy, and robotics. At least that's what I'm noticing for some is to Maybe that's biased. <laughs> Uh, that's that's sure. that's really interesting i mean like climate tech and robotics is the future if we can if we can say that yeah, yeah. i mean i'm still trying to figure out what is um uh, i wanna end my time and invest my time in the same too but, mm-hmm. um yeah i think that those are some hard questions to answer anyway like Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then like uh, talking about your score, course specifically, like the master's in engineering and, and management that you mentioned. So like what are the career prospects that people are looking forward to, like including you in your batch as well? So is it like entrepreneurship? Is it product management? Like what exactly is it all about? Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, the motto of the course is that it's for people who want to lead 
engineering and not e mm-hmm. engineering yeah. so it's very true to that um engineering management basically software engineering managers or hardware engineering managers um at least coming from computer science i used to be like oh all the industries about software but once i stepped in i saw there is so much work happening uh, on the hardware side mechanical side manufacturing side mm-hmm. so all of that those are some of the jobs also um and then product management it's one of the jobs that a lot of people want to do project management um entrepreneurship yes uh, there are a lot of startups mm-hmm. that have come out of this course a lot of people mm-hmm. have done that too but yeah. i would still keep it as broad as leading engineering anywhere in whatever capacity i wouldn't um, narrow mm-hmm. it down further i think i think that's pretty much it for this episode i guess like the like we come to the end of the episode now so like is there one is any any piece of advice that you would love to give to the students who are starting out or let's say let me frame it the other way if you were to start out like if if you were in undergrad right now what what is the advice that you would love to give to yourself um i think sometimes going with the flow is uh-huh. the best thing to do mm-hmm. uh, i was very dejected Uh, when covid happened and i was like this was my year to apply and what am i going to do but life is always i mean you plan and you plan and you plan but then those circumstances show up which are not in your control mm-hmm. um so sometimes it's best to uh, you know go with the flow and let go and then the other thing that i think i've realized and this is me speaking as somebody who's going to touch 30 in a couple of years um be emotionally intelligent it's mm-hmm. way more important than anything else they teach you in school um uh-huh. it's a real life skill like and once you are at a point you realize that everything comes so easy um so even if like things are not working out just, just be patient and just keep working and they might work out and of course be open like if i was so head bent on an mba i would have never been able to experience the experience that i'm having right now uh-huh. be a little more flexible in terms of what you want and know why you're doing something like i knew i, I wanted to be in tech so i was open to this idea sometimes Absolute. you lose sight of it right you know what i mean uh-huh. like yeah yeah you just Absolute. so obsessed with what you want to achieve <laughs> that we lose sight of why we started in the first place exactly exactly so then like the ad- advice that ties into this is that you need to slow down to speed up it's like very ironic as it sounds but then to like pivot your compass in the correct direction you might just want to take a break for some time and then figure out your why of doing things does this fit right yeah not necessarily yeah not even like if take break but just go with the flow i mean <laughs> you can't you, you can only control Uh, yeah i think a very beautiful way to put it and one of my managers taught me this through a ted talk you're constantly negotiating with reality right it's mm-hmm. not like you always get what you want it's a negotiation uh-huh. you put in your hard work for x then you get y so the y that you get is actually the negotiation mm-hmm. so just be open it's very philosophical but it makes sense <laughs> it's true i mean when she put Absolutely. it that way i was very was like that's a beautiful thing you told me and taught uh-huh. me today like absolutely reality. i'm going i'm going to pass this on i'm going to pass it on <laughs> this is like <laughs> yeah it's a ted talk by someone i don't know by who but she quoted it to me in one of my one on ones and i was like this is beautiful i never thought yeah, like absolutely. this way yeah, yeah. um so with this answer we come to the end of the episode thank you so much for taking out time and like you know doing this podcast and uh, it was it was a great conversation i learned a lot and i'm pretty sure a lot of students who are watching this episode will also learn a lot i'm glad i'm glad i could be of help and all the best thank for your exams thank you thank you thank you. thank you so much thank you have a great day yeah